So uh, we're going to begin our Iowa City City Council budget work session for Wednesday, January the 16th, 2019. So uh, we would like to end no later than 345. So in order so that some of us can go to the Cross Park open house. If we can't, well, I don't know. We'll see. But I, I'm pretty sure we can work our way through it and in a very adequate way. <clears throat> So the first topic is to review the proposed budget. Yeah, I'm going to make a suggestion that we just hold this for Tuesday's work session. You're waiting on a couple of uh, memos for us on outstanding budget items. That, that's mostly operating stuff. So I'd suggest we skip past that and jump right into CIP unless there's something Sounds good to me. Uh, new that we need to talk about. Makes sense. Any objection to that? Nope. No. All right, so we'll move on to the next item, capital improvements projects. Are you going to start, Jeff? Yeah, uh, Dennis is going to lead off. I just want to call attention to the handouts. Um, you have seen these handouts before. These are just updated versions of the, the bike and park master plan, and those will be talked about uh, through the presentation. Uh, what you have not seen before is this big white spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that uh, you had requested from me earlier in the year. <laughs> And that is a, a report on the changes from last year's CIP. And you can see kind of the magnitude of changes that we go through. Uh, so this will call attention to projects that have increased or decreased in price, projects that have shifted. Uh, so as we go through the different divisions, you'll be able to see and ask questions uh, if you have them about why a project has uh, changed from last year's CIP. OK, very good. So Dennis, are you going to? Be the first to speak. Uh, yep, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. And I'm um, here with uh, Jason Havel and Ron Kanaki. Uh, I'm Dennis Bach, I'm said the finance director. And I'm going to start with a brief overview of the entire program and and uh, the process that we went through to, to develop this program. Um, and just kind of talk about you know overall how the money is being spent, where it's coming from. And then I want to hand it off to, to Jason and Ron. And uh, the rest of the department has to talk more specifically about the projects that are within that plan. Um, so uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the first slide is the schedule. Uh, we started this progress our process uh, late summer. Um, and this uh, process runs fairly parallel to the city's budget process. And uh, September 4th, uh, the Finance Department sent out forms to each of the departments along with instructions uh, to update the current program and to get new projects. Uh, September 25th, those forms uh, with the new projects and amended projects were due back uh, to the Finance Department. Uh, and then once those are back, then we assemble them into a preliminary report. And through the month of October, uh, there's a committee that meets several times, and we uh, discuss those projects, how they work together, the timing of them, and an update and make changes to those projects in the overall program. Uh, and then actually that's running parallel with the budget process. And then in early December, uh, we start pulling the operating budget and the capital budget together to, to see how they work together and, and, and pull all the information to one document. And then on December 21st, uh, we released uh, the, the budget book, which included the operating budget and the capital uh, CIP program into that. Uh, and that leads us to today, where we're here to talk about uh, the program and all the projects that have been assembled uh, in that budget book. And, and so um, in the budget book, there is includes the five-year program. It has the uh, overview reports and then detailed worksheets. Um, and uh, you should be able to follow along or read for additional information within that budget book uh, as we present today. Um, and so I'm going to move into the uh, overall uh, spending program. Uh, this is a pie chart uh, for the spending by division. And uh, as usual, uh, streets uh, is the number one uh, spending division, and that's primarily uh, the asphalt overlay is the largest portion of that. And we also have a handful of major reconstruction projects uh, that are also incorporated into that total. Uh, the second largest pie in there is the uh, wastewater treatment. Um, and there's a couple of major uh, uh, Pro, our projects in there for reconstruction of portions of the, the plant, some of the older portions uh, that have pushed that number up a little bit. And then the third largest is the uh, transit, uh, which is almost entirely made up of a future uh, replacement of the transportation facility. 
Um, and so this kind of gives you a general idea of, of which departments, of uh, which projects and dollar amounts in the program. I will point out that the city manager's slice of $6.5 million is on the kind of a, uh, around five o'clock there, I guess you could say on the, on the pie chart. Uh, that is for the access center. So that is in this, uh, this year's CIP program. Um, so how we are paying for these projects, uh, for the, the funding sources, and uh, about $163.5 million worth of funding sources. Um, the number one funding source is our general obligation bonds. So uh, that, other than uh, the water and sewer and the enterprise fund projects, geo bonds is our number one funding source for uh, most of the uh, street and parks and other types of improvements that are being presented today. Uh, the number two source is uh, federal funds. Um, now, we'll note that there's a large portion of that federal funds uh, that we are anticipating that would be for the replacement of the transit facility, uh, but also as primarily for uh, street reconstruction, uh, like Dodge Street would be a large portion of that, or American Engine Road. Um, and that also includes another uh, portion of that would be airport, which is about 90% of the airport projects are funded from uh, federal funding. Uh, the third largest piece of that is the road use tax funding. And I talked about you know bonding for a lot of road projects. Uh, most of those are the major reconstruction. Uh, the road use piece is primarily for asphalt overlay and, and other kind of miscellaneous like the ADA curb ramp, uh, traffic signals, and some of the other types of improvements. Um, and the next slide uh, is for the program by year. And it's typical that uh, we see more dollars or more spending in the first year of the program, and it reduces down to the fifth year. Um, now, in this scenario, as you look at that pie, or that bar chart, uh, 2022 is very high, uh, and that's because of the $18 million that's in there for the transit facility uh, has pushed that that higher than you would typically see in this uh, this form of presentation. And then in 2023, it's also high, and there's pretty much two projects planned out there that are pushing that number. Uh, and one of that is the Dodge Street Reconstruction Project, which is a pretty significant project that would be doing joint with the state. And then also, as I mentioned, the wastewater uh, reconstruction project uh, to rebuild the, the digester complex. Um, but this is how we anticipate as far as dollars and spending and when these projects are being done, how uh, it looks graphically. Uh, so if you don't have any questions about the overall program, I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Jason here and, and, and Ron, and they can start to take you through the rest of the program. Sure. Uh, Ron Kanucky, Public Works Director. Uh, obviously, we thank you for the time to sit down and walk through the capital project with you. Um, the, the, the location that this starts on in the budget book is page 489, is the capital project section. Um, in that, uh, about around page 513 is where the detailed descriptions of the projects begin. So uh, we have 100, about 143 slides left to go through in regards to the ongoing projects. So we have it split up into three sections. There's an ongoing section, so those are the projects that are under construction now or will be shortly. Uh, we have a section that is split up by departments, and then we have an on the radar section, which will go over um, projects that are that we feel are, are ones that will potentially come up here in a, in a short time frame that weren't included in the program itself. So uh, we'll go ahead and start off with the ongoing projects. Um, the, the first project is a permitting software upgrade. So this is uh, a joint uh, venture between NDS and Public Works uh, to update our building uh, permitting software and then also incorporate uh, our some of our right-of-way management permits in with that software. Um, this uh, project was actually just kicked off at the last uh, council meeting. Uh, the contract for the moving forward with this was approved. Uh, second ongoing project is a public works facility. Um, this one, uh, they have started uh, putting the, the footings in. Um, they'll actually move into the warm storage area here next week and start um, renovating that for the use of public safety. Um, in this project, we do have an additional $700,000 as we move into the solar um, facilities or addition of solar array to this project. Um, and we'll be um, working with Newman Munson to, to get the, the details of that that project worked out here in the next month. 
All right, moving on to the landfill leachate uh, pumping system. So this is the dual extraction system out at the landfill that looks to uh, remove not only leachate, but also uh, landfill gas from the area. So um, this is one that is more or less complete, just finishing up a, a few small items with this project. The Myrtle and Riverside intersection signalization. So this is the project that is being completed in conjunction with the overlay on Riverside Drive. This is will include signalization of the intersection as well as a median that will be installed on Riverside Drive. Uh, right now that project sits, the median has been installed. Uh, the overlay will be completed in the spring. Uh, we're hoping that some of the signalization will occur this winter, but again, it, it really just depends on weather and, and what the contractor is able to complete. Looking at completion, probably late spring, uh, early summer for that one. The Riverside Drive pedestrian tunnel. So as a reminder, this is along Riverside Drive, just south of the Myrtle intersection. This will be on the west side of Riverside Drive. The intent of the project would be to put a pedestrian tunnel through the railroad embankment um, that would, as part of the project, would then complete the sidewalk connection basically from Benton up to Myrtle Avenue. Uh, we are proceeding with design. This one's been on hold for a little bit as we've been working through some delays with the railroad um, and some issues there. Uh, at this point, we're kind of full speed ahead with design, hopefully uh, looking at construction yet in 2019. Uh, the Riverside Drive and Governor Street overlay, again, this is kind of all of these projects are kind of in that same area. This is the overlay that will be essentially from the Rocky Shore, so the Iowa City city limits down to uh, Sturgis Corner, and that'll be that overlay on Riverside Drive. It also includes the overlay on Governor Street, basically from Burlington up to the Dodge intersection. Uh, along with that Governor Street work, we'll also be uh, including bicycle lanes on Governor Street as well as bicycle lanes on Dodge, um, kind of for that same stretch. Jason, with regard to both of these Riverside Drive projects, I don't see them listed in this big master matrix or whatever one calls that. Yep, and I think part of that is because it would have actually been past year monies, is that correct? So, right, are you talking about the in the changes or just in the current changes program? Not current, not so I should not expect to see yeah, th this is Jason just described have, on this. Yeah, these, these are things that have changed from, like in the 19 program would have changed, and I believe much of that program was in 18 for the overlay. Okay. The Burlington and Madison intersection improvements, this is one that we're uh, working to wrap up design and hopefully looking at construction for 2019. Um, this will include um, improvements to the intersection, new signal at the intersection, new curb ramps. Um, we are also looking at including bike lanes that will uh, cross the Iowa River, so basically bicycle lanes from Madison over to Riverside Drive. As part of this project, we'll also be restriping Madison for four lane to three lane conversion. When is that going to be done anyway? Uh, right now we're looking at completion hopefully late 19, depending on where we end up with the um, the DOT bidding cycle, that may slide, but that's we're really shooting for uh, getting that bid late spring and then hopefully that would allow us to get construction yet this year. And the, and the bike lanes will run north-south from where to? So it goes from, I believe, court north to market, I believe is the, the scope of that. The Idlewild stormwater drainage diversion, so this is a project near the Idlewild development. Uh, essentially what this will do is it will allow for um, lower flow events to still drain through the Idlewild development and that's important because they need that, that turnover for those ponds and just to keep water moving through that development. But for those larger rain events, it will actually divert the, the runoff directly to the Iowa River. Looking at finishing design here, um, Again, probably looking at spring completion for, for bidding and then construction in 2019. 
the Normandy Drive storm sewer replacement. This will replace some uh, storm sewer that's in poor shape. It will also make some modifications to the existing structure. Essentially what that will allow us to do is uh, improve the ability to pump during flood events from this structure. So pretty minor improvements, but should hopefully um, help with operations for future events. The Burlington and Clinton intersection improvements, this is one that we started construction in 2018. Um, right now, as it stands, for the most part, the signal work has been more or less completed. There's a few things they'll have to do to kind of tie over to the new signal completely. Uh, and then they'll be back in the spring to finish up with the permanent paving of the curb ramps. Um, but most of the, the water main and a lot of the paving work has been completed. Can can people cross the street safely now? Uh, they should have at least temporary paving for all the curb ramps out there now. So yes, they should, they should have existing curb ramps. Uh, and I should also note that this will, in the spring, also include the four lane to three lane conversion on Clinton Street and then the inclusion of bike lanes from Church down to Benton. And when this will be completed? I would say early spring, it's going to really depend on temperatures. I, I think they can start as soon as it gets warm enough to do the uh, pouring the curb ramps and doing the, the striping. The pedestrian mall reconstruction, uh, as many of you know, this is a two-year project, so they were focusing on kind of the north-south section this year. We'll look at uh, reconstruction of the pedestrian mall, uh, new paver surface, uh, revised and improved planning areas, as well as new stage and canopy. Next year, we, or I guess this year now, 2019, um, we'll continue with the east-west section and looking at completion of the project this year. All right, moving on to some of the parks projects. Creekside Park on the east side of town um, is under construction as we speak. Um, the park is it's fenced off and unfortunately not open to the public right now. Um, we've got a lot of clearing done along the creek because this includes creek access, a new shelter, a new restroom, and then a community orchard space next to it on some of the new uh, newer flood property. Riverfront Crossings Park, um, just down there yesterday, the restroom and shelter are coming along very nicely. Um, it was starting to turn green before the snow came in, so we're looking forward to a July 20th grand opening party down there. Um, the final money, money in the funding for this is primarily for the traffic circle, inside the traffic circle, and as you remember, we're gonna re uh, relocate the Snelson sculpture um, to the inside of the traffic circle, and then we'll finish up with a, a park sign and some um, landscape in that area. Um, most of the lights are in. There's a few more signs to be placed there. Quick question, if you went back one real quick. Is that supposed to be 1.2 million? Correct. <laughs> yeah, <you>. please. <laughs> I just, well, I just, because I was going to ask if we can have this, the whole slide thing available and then available for the public. So yep. might want to add a zero. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And then Hickory Hill Park Trail and Bridge Project uh, just successfully bid this part of, part of the project, um, and they will start work in the spring, um, probably complete most of it this spring. Um, the REAP grant work, though, however, started last week, and there's been significant invasive species removal just in the last week, so the park's already starting to look different. Um, just better, better shape, but looking a little bit different. All right, so the next section we'll move on to annual projects. And so these are the projects where there's money available annually, so every year in the program. And we'll kick things off with the bicycle master plan. Good afternoon, Kent Ralston, Transportation Planner. Um, knowing time of a, is of the essence, I'll run through some of the bike master plan projects uh, relatively quickly. Uh, I think most of you know that the bike master plan was adopted in August of 2017, uh, and I think we've made a lot of uh, good progress since then. Uh, the planning process was about nine months long, um, and also we have since uh, implemented a standing bicycle advisory committee. Uh, that same bicycle advisory committee that helped implement or ex excuse me help plan for the uh, planning document is now in place to help us implement it as well so we meet with them about every other month um, at a minimum quarterly to talk about a lot of the policies educational components uh, and encouragement components of the plan that, that really we won't discuss today through the capital projects uh, what I'd like to like to do quickly is is quickly orient you I believe you all have this uh, in front of you um, just to orient you very quickly there's a lot of information on this graphic 
Uh, what you'll see first are two different colors of tags, which represent projects. Uh, in orange are the projects that were identified in the master plan for 2017 and 2018, and in the blue, the projects that were identified in the plan for 19 through 22, which was the five-year CIP uh, at the time the plan was adopted. Um, very quickly, I just want to uh, note that 2019 is going to be a really big year uh, for the bicycle master plan. Uh, Jason already covered a number of projects uh, that will be occurring as part of larger capital improvement projects, uh, but there's a, a host of other projects as well that'll be completed in 2019. Uh, really gonna be an exciting year, and I think with all the bike master plan, um, bike lanes, and other projects that'll be completed, it's really going to add more on-street facilities uh, in one capital year than uh, we have today uh, in total in Iowa City. Uh, quickly, just running through some of the projects, uh, I'll start with some of the projects uh, that were to be completed in 2017 and 2018 are now being pushed to 2019 for uh, various reasons. Uh, Jason had already mentioned the Clinton and Madison four to three lane conversions uh, that include bike lanes. Uh, also, we have the Mormon Trek uh, four to three lane conversion project that was started last fall and will be, com be completed this coming year, uh, which add bike lanes from Melrose uh, essentially down to Highway uh, 1. Uh, also, we have the Myrtle and Riverside intersection, which is another project that Jason mentioned. Uh, along with that project, we also are installing a number of bike components, uh, the pedestrian refuge island that was, that was identified, as well as a climbing bike lane, we call it, up the Myrtle Hill. So Myrtle's not actually wide enough to have bike lanes on both sides, but because it's a challenge getting up the hill, we'll actually have one bike lane uh, for those folks heading west going up the hill. Uh, also a number of bike wayfinding signs will be installed so folks can find their way from the Iowa River Corridor Trail onto uh, Benton Street, which will be also slated for bike lanes uh, in coming years. Uh, a couple of the other major uh, bike lane projects, uh, again, that Jason mentioned, were the Governor and Dodge Street uh, bike lanes. Uh, what's interesting about those two is they'll both be buffered bike lanes, which will be our first buffered bike lanes um, for the most part in town. Uh, so rather than just a single white stripe, we'll actually have a couple feet of um, pavement markings to sort of get that uh, bicyclist a little bit further away from the adjacent travel lane, uh, which will be a, a really good project. Uh, a few other projects I just wanted to make note of is the Highway 1 uh, side path. I'm assuming that'll come up later in the presentation today, uh, but that'll be the trail that runs from Sunset to Mormon Trek. Uh, years ago, uh, the, the portion from Orchard to Sunset was complete, but this completes that loop onto Mormon Trek, which then gets bicyclists to the existing sidewalk and the future bike lanes. So we're really starting to or, uh, develop this, um, this sort of bike path around uh, the metro area, which was a major component of the bike master plan. Um, the other one that I wanted to mention quickly is Gilbert Street. Uh, that is in 2020, but I wanted to mention that we have a functional design for the four to three lane conversion on Gilbert Street complete. Uh, the engineering department is now hiring someone to complete the final design, which they'll be able to bring to you uh, in the coming months. Um, so, most of these projects are nested in larger projects, some of which you've already heard about, some of which will be coming later in the presentation, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. The other thing I wanted to mention quickly is the $900,000 that's uh, identified in the CIP really is just a fraction of the actual overall funding that you all are putting into bike and pedestrian planning, uh, because again, a lot of these bike improvements are part of much bigger capital improvements. Any questions for me now? For the buffered bike, for the buffered bike yeah. lanes, how much more expensive is it to put the little white posts up on the bike lanes? Is uh, I don't know if I know appropriate here, but just in general cost-wise, how, how much bigger of a cost is that? You know, I don't know for sure, uh, Rockney. I think the cost would be relatively low, and compared to these, the overall capital project, uh, we did look into whether or not we could use those on Dodge and Governor. But because there are so many driveways uh, along both those corridors, it would have been hard to to actually use those um, bollards, I call them. But yeah, okay. yeah. Any other questions for Ken? Oh, thank Thanks. You. All right, moving on. The annual stormwater improvements, this is, again is an annual uh, account that helps with basically improvements throughout the stormwater system. So this could be everything from intakes to manholes, uh, uh, storm sewer pipe, any of those improvements also looks at ditches and other um, methods of conveying stormwater um, and varies throughout the city based on the, the products of need. 
the annual traffic signal projects, this account looks to uh, provide for whether it's new signals, uh, replacement of signal equipment, or it can be updating of signal equipment. Um, that happens from time to time, and it can be related to other projects or standalone, um, again, as needed. Traffic calming, so obviously you know we have our traffic calming program uh, that relies on neighborhood uh, input and, and that process. For those projects that do make it through that process and we look to construct something, this is essentially how we would pay for that. For our, our annual curb ramp program, this is one that looks throughout the city and picks some locations annually to go in and install new or update curb ramps. Uh, historically, what we've focused on is, are those areas where there may be pedestrian facilities, but there are no curb ramps, um, but there are other areas where we update those to meet current requirements. Are there lots of um, areas that still need <coughs> curb, uh, curb ramps? I, I think there, there's certainly some areas that need curb ramps. There's certainly a lot more areas that need them to be updated. And is there like a greater plan to meet some of that in the future to uh, do some of this? Yeah, we have uh, but we have information that basically lists, I guess you could say, uh, the condition of curb ramps throughout the city or curb locations. Um, and so we look at those, whether it's through this program or through other projects, ways that we can can improve those. And if someone came and made a, um, like a complaint about access, what would be the response? Is that so typically we, what we would do is we would take those complaints and we would include those on our list for future projects for consideration. And again, whether um, those could be incorporated a number of different ways, but we would look to incorporate those as we're able to with future projects. Okay. Thank you. If and I remember, oh, I'm sorry, Maz. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, please. Uh, you know, at the budget, like 500,000 is... Uh, it's just like uh, for for certain ramp that you're gonna uh, you're gonna do it or what is for then? If we have like many, as Bruce said, that need to be like to have a ramp on it, is this gonna take like the budget is for all of them or is this for some of them or are you gonna do it all this year or? So I think this would be an ongoing process. So this would not be for all ramps throughout the city, but okay, this is also them. not the only pot of money, I guess, that is used for curb ramp repairs. But it is one way that we focus on, this project focuses specifically on curb ramps at various locations. Okay. That means this budget you're going to use only to do those curb ramps? Correct. Yep. And maybe you're not going to finish all of them. Next year you do another one. Yeah. So we, okay. yep, we basically spend this money or the annual allowance for uh, only curb ramps. Sure. Yeah, and I don't, I don't ever see this line going away, even if we get curb ramps everywhere, mm -hmm. over time they fall out of compliance, just like you have potholes oh. and roads, you get the heave, uh, heaving of concrete um, and just general cracking and, and uh, state of disrepair. So we'll always be going in and sure. rehabbing them. Uh, this is like undergoing budget, so you can this use This is it. an okay. every year deal. Sure. At some point in the past, the staff has presented us with a map of uh, showing uh, curb ramps throughout the city, at least the one, sites where curb ramps are needed or they need to be upgraded. It's a pretty extensive or pretty large number of mm -hmm. sites that need to be improved. So we're just trying to do it year by year by year by year by year. <laughs> Is there in, new, in new projects, I'm assuming we do it in the beginning yeah. as a part of the project. Correct. Yep. I'll just ask because the thought came. Uh, what, what about sidewalk infill? Is, is there a line item for sidewalk infill? So there's no longer a, a dedicated line item for sidewalk infill. Um, the way we've been approaching that uh, now is that we would look at those projects and propose them as, as individual projects. So there's still the ability to do those, but there's not the, the line item that was there previously. Our annual pavement rehabilitation program, uh, obviously a big portion of this every year is the asphalt overlay, but it also includes PCC patching, um, crack sealing, um, other, I guess, sort of pavement management projects. Uh, one thing I wanted to make sure and point out with this one, we actually are in the process, uh, we have an RFP out there right now looking to get a consultant on board to help us take a, a fresh look at this and, and really kind of an overarching look at um, our program, not only 
current condition, um, but what we want things to be long term and, and have them come in and help us with um, trying to set sort of that baseline level that we want our facilities to be maintained at and, and help us get a better understanding of what that initial cost might be to get us there and then also what the annual cost would be to, to keep us there, um, as well as helping to plan out longer term for projects that we would want to look at. Um, and certainly that would be helpful come budget time and also if we ever were to pursue a discussion on uh, local option sales tax. So t good information to have. Yeah, I, I was just going to get in that. Um, um, you know, every community is different, um, but sometimes they're helpful for sort of point of reference. I think Cedar Rapids, correct, is yeah, a substantial I, portion of their local option sales tax. Yeah, is that I correct? I think Waterloo may as well. I think. Uh, and we always sort of compare property taxes. When you're sort of trying to pick that amount, of course, we have to respond to the local needs here. But to how much do we compare with other cities in terms of percentage of our budget that's focused on that? Because certainly anecdotally, you know, you guys are looking at the whole picture. We tend to look at things very narrowly, but there certainly do seem to see some streets, as we've talked about in the past, that, you know, Washington College, I, th I think, needs some work. Um, how do we compare with other cities? I don't know the answer to that offhand. I think it's it, you certainly could take a look at it, but I think it's going to be difficult to have an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, yep. just given that there's so many different ways that you know, streets are impacted. So you have not only your, you know, your annual, but you may have other projects. You know, you may have some places that spend more on maintenance and more, and other places that may spend more on new construction or reconstruction. So um, I, I don't know if there's um, one answer to that, but I, I think based on just, again, anecdotally, the conversations we've had with consultants, both for this RFP and other discussions, it seems like we're, um, I don't know if we're the best, but we're certainly not the worst. I, I think we're at least in that ballpark. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. And, and what when I can do we say expect the, the oh, sorry? <laughs> when do we expect the uh, that study to be completed? Uh, those are or the proposals are due the end of this month. So I think we'd probably be looking at getting underway uh, here in the next month, month and a half, and then I would say probably maybe end of the summer, something like that. We might have something ready to review. Your list didn't include the brick, and I remember from the discussion when, since we worked on the streets, brick streets recently, uh, that that was very, it's very costly to do that. So this 11 million probably includes that uh, exorbitant amount for that. But is there a plan, like street A will be done this year, street B next year, street C the following year? Well, really what this includes is more spot repairs of brick streets, okay. so it wouldn't really be a, a situation where we would be replacing entire blocks of brick street. Typically those would be separate projects. Project on its own. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Are there plans to, like when I think about the Brown Street and all that stuff, are there plans to replace all those streets or maintain maybe a few of those brick streets throughout um, in, on certain streets? I would say there's not any current projects to reconstruct any of those. I think, uh, at least my understanding is, is more or less we'll maintain what we have. Sure. So. Okay. They're beautiful streets. Yes, they are. <laughs> it, it's, this has been an issue for a long time because it's so costly to re repair and rebuild brick streets but while retaining them as brick streets. But they're, for the most part, really crucial parts of the historic character of particular neighborhoods. And then there's a few brick streets, I guess, that are really kind of outside of the normal parts of the city we think of as, as historic. So we could just kind of rip them out and pave them over, and that would be less expensive. But nice. So anyhow, we we, there, we have no formal plan. Sure, is the bottom line of that. Great, thanks. Underground electrical facilities. So what this project looks to do is those circumstances where we have um, often, if we're relocating electrical facilities, we would look at taking those from overhead to underground. Um, a little bit about how the process works. A lot of times, if we have, say we have a project where we'll need them to relocate electrical facilities, the utility would pay to relocate those to another aerial uh, location, and we would pay for any upcharge to basically go from overhead to underground. Um, sometimes that occurs, again, with our projects, it may, there may be opportunities where redevelopment occurs and we can kind of coordinate with them and, and help to make that a little more economical to go from, uh, again, overhead to underground. 
our annual bridge maintenance and repair project. So uh, one big piece of this is every other year we go through and do bridge condition uh, inspections just to try and, uh, again, kind of keep a, a handle on the condition of our existing structures. With that, that, a lot of times through that process, we'll get some minor repairs and maintenance that's recommended that would come out of this account as well. Uh, this is not meant to handle the large scale uh, replacement or, or larger rehab projects. Those would be individual projects. But again, this is just kind of annual money to help us maintain those structures. And this budget being like a steady o over the years, or sometimes you use the whole thing, sometimes you don't? Or? I, I think it's something where the use will vary. Again, kind of depends on what's needed. Um, so I think sometimes there'll be some years where we won't use it all and it'll roll over, and then we'll use it in a future year. But certainly, it's all used in the end. Sure. So the bridge that's currently, um, I think the block, it's already blocked off the little, I, I forget the name of the bridge, but over by Jefferson Governor, 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 Street. Governor Street. Yep. That would not come out of this 900,000. Uh, no, but that's actually a little different because that's actually on Highway 1, so that's actually a DOT project. Oh, okay. So that one. But if it were our project, then correct. That would come out of its own project. Okay. Annual sewer main replacement. So this project does a, a few different things. It can, can be everything from point repair, so if you have a uh, an issue with a uh, sanitary sewer, it would go in and do that repair. It could repair manholes. Uh, in addition, we also do preventative maintenance, so we do sewer lining to help extend the life of our, our sewer system. Hi there, Darian nagel Gam with the Transportation Services Department. We have two annual recurring projects, the first of which is our parking facility restoration and repair. And this is an annual project that includes concrete repair, sealants, um, uh, repair of joints. It more or less is just upkeep and upgrades to the facilities to keep them in good shape and make sure that we can extend their lifetime um, as far as we possibly can. And the second one is the Transit Bus Shelter Replacement, exp replacement and Expansion Program. Uh, phase one um, is going to occur this spring. We're going to be installing nine new shelters, uh, five on the east side, four on the west side. This will happen, um, we'll begin that project in April. And then phase two will um, add another six new shelters, um, uh, four on the east side, two on the west side. And that will take us f through the first two phases, and we'll pick that back up again after the transit study is completed. We didn't want to invest too heavily um, until we know what our transit system of the future is going to look like. For the transit, I just remind me, I think I mix it up. All this budget for everything that you do is coming from enterprise budget or from the GO bond? Which one? I believe this would come out of the enterprise fund. Enterprise fund, okay. Great, so I'm gonna move you through several of the Parks and Rec projects. So we'll first talk about the annual projects in our Parks and Recreation, and then we'll move on to the specific projects. Um, this first one is City Hall, other projects. These are small projects throughout this building, uh, carpet repair or carpet replacement, painting, um, new the new signs you're seeing, some of those kind of things, uh, the re uh, repair of the, the historic bell outside, those kind of things to come out of this budget. <laughs> Okay, and then our uh, parks annual improvement follows along with our master plan of 2017. And I just want to thank you. We made great progress uh, with the maintenance and, and renovation of our parks throughout the city following this plan. Uh, this chart shows how we're following it. And as you can see, we are on track uh, with many of the projects. Projects completed this year, uh, Happy Hollow Park, Pheasant Hill Park, uh, got a playground the year before, but got new paths to the playground this year as part of the ADA path work. Mercer Park small paths by the playgrounds were completed to help with accessibility to the, the new playground there. Tower Court, same thing, paths to get to the playgrounds. And, and with nearly all of our older playgrounds, they had the railroad ties around the, out, or the landscaping ties, timbers around the outside edge of the playground. Uh, makes it so that someone using um, some assisted devices can't get into that area. So what we're doing is taking those out and providing paved paths to get to the play area. Um, Highland Park 
Same thing, added um, pathways to that park. That actually came from CDBG funding, uh, not from the CIP uh, budget. And then Riverfront Crossing, we already talked about, and Cardigan Park was uh, completed on the east side. I do see some of these don't have, um, well, I see accessibility improvements is what, mm -hmm. um, so I'm assuming all of these have accessibility um, already in place that aren't being improved? Yeah, well, two things. So first of all, some of them are larger full park renovations. And of course, anytime we would renovate a park, we would address accessibility issues at the same time for the larger renovations. The smaller ones are typically where we're just going back in and retrofitting to help make the area more accessible. Okay. And then this is the project that actually addresses a number of those ADA concerns. Uh, as part of the park master plan in 2017, we had uh, the park in, parks inventoried and assessed for accessibility needs. Um, and we are slowly going around and getting those addressed um, two or three parks each year. One of the things you may want to briefly comment on, we've had a lot of discussions with the difference between the padded playground and, and sort of the wood chips. We know that the padded is, is more effective, but it's substantially more um, expensive, correct? Could you give us an approximate dollar figure? And even though it is really more expensive, mm -hmm. are there some parks where we've been able to find the funds to do sure. the top of the line? Uh, first of all, I would back up, though, and say effective, possibly more effective. There's a lot of debate out there about playground surfacing right now. And it may be more effective for certain uh, wheelchair users, but it may not be as effective as a fall attenuation service, uh, surface for a lot of other things. So we're trying to get a mix along with the school district throughout the, throughout the city. Uh, a real ballpark cost estimate, Creekside Park, which we're under, in progress right now, is getting engineered wood fiber, uh, wood chips underneath the playground. I want to say it's four to $5,000 that we're using uh, for that part of that project. It was going to be about $110,000 if we would have poured in place. Um, however, two of the projects I'll talk about soon, uh, Willow Creek and Lower City Park playgrounds will have some areas of port in place surface. So. Thank you. Annual rec center improvements, uh, just slowly chipping away at very long lists at both of our rec centers, um, trying to keep them well maintained. We're seeing, you know, a lot of use through our centers. Uh, they're becoming more welcoming spaces. Along with that use comes a lot of uh, deferred maintenance that we're trying to to address. You've seen a lot of it at Robert A. Lee and Mercer in the last two years, and this fund allows us to do the smaller projects uh, in as we continue with those buildings. Inner city bike trails, not much to say. This follows up with Kent's presentation. These are for smaller um, projects to do connections and some small infield trails at different places. Okay, I'm, now I'm gonna take over driving. <laughs> Okay, so on the parks projects, you have them all listed in your book. I'm just going to highlight. There's so many of them. I'm going to highlight the, the newer ones that are coming up and then some of them that have been added in 2023. Um, so first of all, the projects that are uh, we're working on right now, Willow Creek Park will be on the next council agenda. This is a replacement of the Willow Creek restroom, shelter, and playground. And as I just mentioned, the playground here focuses on inclusion. Uh, it will actually have a music theme, a marching band theme, which is going to be, I can't wait to show you some of those drawings. Um, and it, But it will focus on accessibility, have poured in place, and uh, a lot of things for people to do that, that uh, don't necessarily involve climbing to, to the top heights of the playground. So I think it's going to be really interesting interesting space um, that will set the public hearing at the next council meeting take bids and have this next summer will be under construction and when you say replacing the bathroom for Willow Creek Park, what was wrong with the bathroom that you want to replace? Um, it's the age, uh, the age of the restroom and the, the shelter. So it'll be replaced with structures almost identical to what's being put at Creekside, um, similar to what was done at Happy Hollow following the park master plan. 
uh, the other large playground that we're working on right now is Lower City Park. Um, this will be what we're calling an adventure playground, and what that means is it's going to be built into the slope uh, area of the park between Upper and Lower City Park, um, and it will have uh, numerous slides and kind of towers to climb on. We're still working on kind of final design and concept on that, um, kind of in the site where the old zoo buildings were, for those of you that have been around Iowa City for a long time. Um, so same thing, we hope to have uh, this out to bid um, in the next few months, and then we will have construction over the summer. New on the list is some improvements to the city park ball fields. Baseball is still an exciting, fun sport here in Iowa City. Lots of people playing it. Um, these are improvements to the fields. The first year, um, focusing on player safety, so things happening around the dugouts and the fencing. Um, we have some. Uh, want to make sure people are safe when they're in the dugouts. I'm moving on to some lighting, um, some um, lighting improvements, and some other projects over the next three years um, at city park ball fields. The east side sports site um, on the very far southeast side of town. Um, this is where we're doing tree planting. If you remember the discussion from last year, um, this site was has a, a master plan and that was done to look at building ball fields and soccer fields at this site. Um, no matter what we end up doing at the site, what we are doing now is going along the railroad edge of the property and we'll be planting trees. So no matter what the eventual use is of the project, we'll have that growing and in place to um, buffer it from the railroad. Uh, bids are, or I mean specs are done on this and we'll be bidding it soon um, for spring planting of the trees. In this building, we have a large project coming up in 20 and 21. Uh, it is warm in here today. I have to tell you, though, we are currently operating on only one of two boilers. And even with that, there's a little bit of duct tape and shoelaces involved, maybe. Um, so uh, we're keeping it running. This will replace those systems and get them on the BAS, um, the uh, building automation system for monitoring, uh, as our other buildings are. So um, the, the design is complete now we hope to complete the first um, boiler replacement over the summer when we don't actually need heat in the building. So. Okay, moving on to 2020 projects. Um, the next park for a larger renovation is Weatherby Park. Uh, the plans here are to replace the restroom, shelter, and playground, similar to what we've done at Creekside um, and Willow Creek, although not nearly as large of a playground as what we're doing at Willow Creek. Um, intent is not to do anything with the splash pad, to leave it as it is, the community garden space, the sport court, all those things will remain the same. This will just simply address the shelter, the restrooms, and the small playground that's there. And we would do uh, community meetings for this this summer to work on design with the neighbors in that area. Fair Meadows Park, also in that general area, is a, we're going to replace the playground there with a smaller playground that's aimed at toddlers or preschool age um, kids. We don't actually have a lot of playgrounds throughout our system that are specifically targeted to that age group. Um, this is kind of a unique site because being right next to Grantwood Elementary, um, that playground is very large and very expansive and, and quite, quite fun. Um, but it doesn't have any of the smaller preschool type areas. So we're gonna add that, do that part in the park along with replacing the shelter at this site. Once again, not doing anything with the splash pad there, just the shelter and the um, playground. Um, this picture shows exactly why we need to replace this playground. This is the, the Napoleon playground. It's the playground in the middle of the softball complex. If you played softball down there last summer, you know it was closed a majority of the time because we had such drainage issues and issues with the subsoil underneath it. Um, this will replace it and address those drainage issues as well as providing a better access path to the playground area.
Okay, and then the, the projects are in 2023. Um, Terrell Mill Skate Park uh, redesign. This is uh, this is several years out, but it's it's a park feature that hasn't been touched since it was installed several years ago. So this would, we do get requests almost every year as the new students move in. <laughs> um, can they have you know they want bigger, better, different ramps and different uh, features in the skate park? This will give us a chance to look at that and see what might be possible. It is used. Uh, it's 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 not an area that we often think about too much in our park system, but it is used. Uh, there's a project listed for the Mercer Ballpark Diamond Number no. 4, uh, and this includes artificial turf. This would need to be in partnership with the school district, um, and at this time they haven't uh, they haven't uh, committed funding to it. But we do have it sitting out there as a 2023 project, um, so that if that happens, we can partner with them on that. Okay, and then the um, renovations of Hunter Run Park on the very west side of town, uh, playground shelter, similar to what we're doing in the other park renovations. I see one project that I didn't mention that would be coming up in the next year. Uh, this is at the Recreation Center Mercer Park. Uh, we, we just did the HVAC repairs or replacement this past year. Uh, this takes it to the next step. So if you've been in the entryway in the lobby area of Mercer, it's always very humid in there. And although sometimes that's nice on a cold winter day, what it's doing is eating away at the building um, the envelope of the building. So we want to add a de dehumidification system to the building, and then we'll re redo the tuck pointing and some roof repairs that are being caused because of all the excess moisture there. All right, so I didn't quite hear all the projects, but I'd be happy to answer questions you might have on other ones. I'd just like to mention a couple years ago, I did a mayor's walk out in the general vicinity of Hunter's uh, Run. Park, and every time I'd knock on a door and talk with somebody, I'd ask them if they used the park, do they like it, and that kind of thing. And the answer was, yes, I love it, absolutely, I love it. So I'm really happy to see more work being done on it, making it an even better part of that neighborhood. And of course, that's the basic principle behind all the work we're doing <clears throat> with regard to neighborhood parks, really enhancing the quality of neighborhoods by improving the quality of the neighborhood parks. For the west side, I. I used to live in the west side, and my kids go all the time to Wally Creek Park. Uh, but I was all the time thinking about another park where, uh, like the view close by, by City High, by West High, I mean, where uh, like the neighbor of um, further rich people and the other neighbor, they can like do something. I'm just wondering, is um, the land in front of West High, is that belong to the school or the city? It's a school. Oh, really? Yeah, that is a, it is kind of a, a difficult area for us. A couple things that are happening there, though, is the Walden, uh, Walden Green area is going to have community gardens placed there. So that is one small green space that we own kind of in that neighborhood. Um, I know that the, the Christ the King Church on the corner of Mormon Trek and uh, Melrose, <coughs> they have their own little park that serves the community over there. And it, although it doesn't count as one of our city parks, I know that that <coughs> does serve similar purpose. Um, it, we, there really isn't any other land for us to, that we found to develop in that area. Well, really, because uh, I really see a lot of kids in the neighborhood, so, like by the neighborhood center and uh, Feather Ridge, there is many, many kids over there. And uh, the, the bark at Feather Ridge is not enough for them. I've been seeing like kids fight over the <laughs> playground and yeah. But I thought maybe we own the land in front of the... <laughs> City High, uh, West High, I mean, we can do something there, but it's still. Okay. Maybe, maybe we could do a little tactical urbanism, John, and just go out there and take possession mm. of the yeah. land in front of West High. Yes. I, I have advocated uh, for joint use agreements. I still advocate, would advocate for that between the school district and the city of Iowa City. There are oh. parts of town where, as Julie just said, there, aren't, there isn't land. Uh, Twain is another neighborhood, which other than Highland, there's no neighborhood park in, in Lucas Farms or Twain neighborhood. So I'm, I would support that, you know, if, um, 
because in some cases there really isn't any other option. And I would further say that my observation would be that the school district tends to focus more on the built facility, not so much on the outdoors. So mm -hmm. it, I think we could help kind of fulfill the, the full potential of these sites if we were to address the outdoor spaces. Ah, but we're going to save them discussion. the moving class areas, big space, and don't use it, yeah. Anyway. Thank you. OK, thanks. Next. All right, so we'll move on to public works, and this will cover all the different divisions within public works. Starting off with the, out at the landfill, the <coughs> equipment building, this is a building that's uh, in poor condition, uh, currently isn't able to house all the equipment indoors, so this would look to replace that and, and really not only update it, but again, allow for storage of equipment indoors. The compost pad improvements, this is a, uh, a location where there's been settlement and damage to the existing pad. Um, again, just being on a landfill site, uh, a lot of that settlement, this would look to address that and uh, provide a new compost pad. Southside recycling site, so this will look to install a new location for recycling facilities on the south side. We're looking at uh, potentially a couple different sites here, one being kind of the southeast quadrant of the McAllister Old Highway 218 intersection, uh, also looking um, up there at uh, the boat launch kind of on the north end there uh, in that area as well as a potential location. So I don't know that a final decision's been made, but we'd look at uh, probably one of those two locations for a, a new site. The landfill dual extraction system, so I had mentioned uh, a similar product earlier, the one that we had just completed, this will look to expand on that. I think depending on pricing, we're probably looking at in the neighborhood about eight or nine wells additional that would be completed with this project. The Lower Muscatine area storm sewer improvements, what this will do is look to build off of the Lower Muscatine reconstruction product that was done a few years ago. Um, we'll look to extend some of the storm sewer that was done with that project into the surrounding neighborhood. There's really little to no storm sewer in that neighborhood, and so this will look to help collect that water before it all gets down to Lower Muscatine. Um, Sycamore is another location that would be included with this project. Uh, for those of you familiar with that area, there's a lot of water that comes down to forest and, and then uh, Sycamore as well. North Westminster area, this is an area where a couple of years ago we had done a, a study to look at localized flooding in this area. What this project would do would be to implement some of the recommendations and recommended improvements that were done with that study. West River Bank stabilization, this is one that you've seen recently. Uh, we recently rejected the first round of bids for this one. Uh, so this will install a retaining wall and, and riprap and other kind of stabilization measures along the west side of the river, just north of Highway 6. Um, and we'll also set it up for a future trail project. Equipment shop, parking lot overlay, this is one that's been in there uh, previously and we'll really just look to overlay the existing parking lot. Um, again, this is one that's really showing its age and uh, up for the wear and tear, so uh, a new parking lot overlay for that one. Salt, stand, uh, salt and sand storage bunkers. This would be out at the new public work site. This is uh, an item that was included originally in the project and then was cut as we were trying to bring that project within budget. Um, really what this would do is provide some cover storage for salt and sand. Uh, could also be used for topsoil and other materials that are used um, for kind of daily operations for, for streets and other divisions. Brine maker and blending station, this would help to uh, allow the city to use brine. A lot of times this is used for pre-treating of roadways for, for winter maintenance, um, and so this would be adding that capability. American Legion Road, 
this will look to reconstruct American Legion Road from Scott Boulevard to Taft Avenue. It will include a roundabout at the Scott and American Legion Road intersection. It will reconstruct this section of street as a two-lane section, but it will go from a rural cross-section to an urban cross-section, so we would add curb and gutter, storm sewer. Um, also, we'll look at adding a, a wide sidewalk on the north side as well as a, a standard sidewalk on the south side. Um, also includes the pedestrian underpass near the Barrington Road intersection. The McAllister Boulevard extension, this will extend McAllister Boulevard um, from where it currently ends just east of Gilbert Street. This will extend it to the, the northern roundabout on Sycamore. Um, we'll also include some utility work uh, as well as that and then also looking to include the signalization of the McAllister Gilbert Street uh, intersection. Prentice Street bridge replacement, you can see here, it currently is triple uh, corrugated metal culverts that are in extremely poor condition. We have uh, ongoing issues with um, settlement and voiding occurring under the pavement, so looking at replacing that with a, a new structure, looking at um, working through design of that right now. The next two projects kind of go together, the first one being the Melrose Avenue improvements, also IWV, so this will be a joint project with the county that will reconstruct the two-lane section that is there now. It will actually stay a, a rural section, but we're looking at adding wide shoulders to help for kind of uh, bicycle facilities out into the county. Um, it will reconstruct it from where the county had recently done a project at Hebel near the, the landfill entrance and extend that to basically just west of Highway 260. Uh, Highway 218, and then with that, we will also look to extend water main to the landfill. Buke Street reconstruction, this is a project, I, I would say, similar to what was done on Washington Street. It'll be for a block of Dubuque Street, basically between Washington and Iowa Avenue. So again, uh, street reconstruction as well as utility work and streetscape improvements for this, this section. Kirkwood Avenue and Capitol Street extensions. So this will be in the Riverfront Crossings area. Uh, it in extends Kirkwood Avenue approximately uh, a block as well as Capitol uh, approximately a block and then they'll have some sort of intersection. This will be there right by the Riverfront Crossings Park and will uh, help to accommodate some of the uh, anticipated redevelopment in this area. With that, that will also, was going to mention that it will also include removal of the existing railroad spur that is, that crosses Benton Street that is no longer used. <coughs> First Avenue and Scott Boulevard, looking at installing a roundabout in this location. Uh, it's currently a four-way stop. We uh, pretty regularly get complaints about this area for from a queuing and, and delay standpoint. So uh, looking at this project to help address those issues. Court Street reconstruction. This will look to reconstruct court from Muscatine to First Avenue. So this would be not only street paving, it would be new sidewalk, utility work, um, all of that uh, in the stretch. Would it widen the Court Street? I don't know that we've looked at, at have a final answer to that. I don't think that we would look to necessarily widen it, um, okay. but we would evaluate that with part of the design. Okay. Benton Street rehabilitation, so this would look at some concrete patching as well as an asphalt overlay, basically from Mormon Trek down to uh, just short of Greenwood. Some of you may remember a couple years ago, we actually did the hill on Benton Street, we uh, overlaid that, so we would kind of fill in that section. Um, also would focus on ADA improvements, so new curb ramps um, with that as well. And then also, I wanted to mention, uh, currently out there, there's a, a shoulder that is striped. It's not technically a bike lane. This would actually widen that to allow for uh, an official bike lane to be included on um, Benton Street as well. Would that be buffered? I don't think we'd be able to fit buffered in there because we wouldn't be changing the curb lines, but it will be uh, the proper width for a bike lane. 
Second Avenue bridge replacement. This is essentially um, replacing the structure that's there. Uh, also would look for some street paving to tie that back in. Uh, one of the, a couple of the other improvements that will be done with this project is to provide a sidewalk uh, crossing here as well and then tie into some of the sidewalk that's in the neighborhood existing as well as a uh, water main connection under the creek in this location. Rochester Avenue, so this would be a reconstruction from essentially Ralston Creek to First Avenue. Um, a few years ago, we had reconstructed the bridge over Ralston Creek, so we would take off from that project and then to the east to First Avenue. Again, uh, complete reconstruction, street, sidewalk, utilities um, with that one as well. Highway 1, Highway 6 intersection. Um, this is a, a study to look at the intersection. This is one that we've um, been looking at for a little while. It, it's certainly uh, not ideal with a skewed intersection, uh, really no pedestrian accommodation. So this is a kind of a study to look at what we might want for a long-term solution. And then once we have that study, we could look at a, a future project to, to construct those improvements. Dodge Street reconstruction, so this is one that was mentioned earlier. We're actually working on the, the functional design for this right now to, to figure out what the overall design might look like, but this would be for actual construction of that section. With this being a uh, highway route, this would be one that we would share with the DOT, so there would be some cost sharing there as well, um, but it would be complete reconstruction. Again, uh, street, sidewalk, utilities, all of that included in the project. Market Street and Jefferson Street two-way conversion. This is one, again, that has been mentioned previously. We'd be looking at going from one-way to two-way. With that, we'd have to do some signal improvements and some other improvements that may be needed. Obviously, restriping. Uh, would also be looking at the addition of bicycle facilities in this location. Uh, I believe the, the bicycle master plan calls out buffered bike lanes. Uh, I think it's going to depend on what we have for street width there. Uh, right now, it's with it being one-way, you have essentially uh, a bike lane in one direction on each one. So whether or not we can fit them on both directions, I think that's yet to be seen, um, but we would fit in what, what we're able to. I'm assuming there were conversations about why the change from a one-way to a two-way. Mm -hmm. um, can you give me a brief... I, I think in general, there's been a, a movement away from one-way streets. Um, I think they, in the past, were viewed as a way to move traffic through town. I, I think, you know, when you start talking about neighborhoods and that kind of stuff, they've been viewed as, as not as conducive to that. And so I think that's kind of the general thought is that it, it would have a more neighborhood feel and a, a better fit within an urban environment when it's two-way traffic. Okay. It was also by taming traffic speeds on roads like those two, you have an opportunity to increase the economic value of businesses along those streets. If, if they're treated, I'm going to use the word sewers, if they're treated like sewers through which vehicles run, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't mean to have too much of an analogy there, then that has the tendency to decrease the value of property because all people are trying to do is get through very quickly instead of treating it as a place where people can walk, people can sit outdoors, and local businesses can thrive. I think when we get to that point, there will be a lot of discussion because I think this is... I think this is probably a very controversial issue within the community. I don't think it's, I don't think you're going to see 100% of the people that say this change is good. So I think there'll be a lot of public discussion. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. Bruce, I see some Jeff Speck videos on your future. He was the urban planner that came two or three years ago, and he's written a lot about walkable city. Um, and he's at least persuaded some of us that um, it does really give a more neighborhood feel. The safety improvements are dramatic. The, safe, the, the, the reduction in speeds is significant, um, which, of course, does mean some delay in um, going across town. It's relatively marginal, but I think that's where some of the controversy comes. And we've seen that, I think, on Mormon Trek. Oh, that's not necessarily a conversion. Um, it's narrowing the street. It's not necessarily narrowing here, but I think the reduction in speeds that I think causes some of the controversy. But I'll send you some Jeff Speck videos for, for your watching. Uh, on that point, Bruce, I think what Rockney's really saying is that he, he's going to give you a gift. 
which is a most a recent uh, a copy of the most recent book that Jeff Speck has written. It's called The Walkable City, but it's an update of that book, and it's probably would be very enlightening for you to read, and then you'd form your own judgment about what you think, but uh, it'd be really helpful to read. Jason, I want to ask you a question. Could you go back to Highway 6 and Highway 1? Because my question really... I do have one, one last question on yeah, that. Sure. Uh, will there only be uh, parking on one side of the street? I don't know that that's been decided at this point. Right. I think we kind of look at various options. All right. Thanks. So I want to make a point about this intersection. Right now, it's an, an intersection of flows. It, it's just traffic. What I think we have an opportunity to do is to treat it as a place and to try to make it into a place that in itself has appeal instead of just being a place through which traffic moves. It's a big opportunity. I wish we would really think about it seriously. And it's just, so to do that, you can't think only in terms of moving traffic. You have to think about urban design. You have to think about all the other aspects associated with that. So, Jeff Speck and others uh, have a lot of advice about that. But I hopeful, I'm hoping that ahead, looking ahead, when staff gets to this particular topic in a very serious way, that you will take into account and the council will take into account the idea of placemaking there instead of just facilitating flow. <laughs> I guess I don't understand what that exactly means, but maybe reading the book, it kind of helped me uh, because um, it seemed like we would do some type of a structure to make um, that corner look good. And for me, that would be distractive, <laughs> you know, in my mind right now from what I'm hearing. But I'll read the book and maybe you can talk to me about this later. Yeah, good. I, I have suggested before, I uh, can't remember the context, but. So we are talking budget of um, having a small library available to council and staff of books like Jeff Speck's new book um, that could be loaned out to to yourself or anyone who was interested in whatever the topics that would be covered by by the books in there. <laughs> nice. I think we've talked about the pedestrian lack of friendliness along Highway 1, Highway 6 quite a bit, and, and there had been some talk at times of along that stretch somewhere having more of a pedestrian overpass kind of a thing that would make it easier for pedestrians. Because you do see people, and, and bikers too, uh, trying to cross there, not necessarily at that Highway 1, 6 intersection, uh, but we do see a few, and now there's a Starbucks going in there, and there's, there's going to be more people in the new where Joanne's was and where Paul's was. There's going to be probably some more pedestrian traffic. So. Uh, I, I think maybe we can keep that in mind as part of that, too, as some kind of overpass for the pedestrians. If you're on a bike or on foot, that intersection is insane. It's just, uh, you, it's totally unsafe to try to cross it on bike or on foot. Moving down to wastewater, the clarifier repairs. Uh, this is really uh, repairs of original equipment to the, the plant. We've actually replaced a couple of them, so this would replace uh, two more of those clarifiers. The Scott Boulevard trunk sewer. This is out on the east side of town, just north of the railroad tracks, east of Scott Boulevard. It would look at extending the sanitary sewer that's there existing, extending it to kind of the northeast up to American Legion Road. There's actually a lift station on the north side of American Legion Road in that location. Uh, that would go away as part of this project and allow it to be fed uh, gravity sewer. Um, instead of having that, that pump station. Um, obviously with the new school out there, there's likely to be significant interest in development of this area and, and that, that this project would help with that as well. I was just gonna make a point about that. Looking at the uh, photograph on the left shows the new school on the upper right, right, the new Hoover School. So, you know, we, we've uh, just commissioned Opticos to do a form-based code for the area around Alexander Elementary. And when we first started thinking about that, our idea was to use the information they come up with and the code they come up with for application in, the, in this area that, like Jason just said, is going to be developed once, you can, once there's a sewer line and so on in the general vicinity or serving the area. Yeah, so you've got to see these things as part of a whole. Sure. 
Nevada Avenue sanitary sewer, this one should be, knock on wood, hopefully pretty straightforward, just replacing uh, an existing sanitary sewer that's in, in poor condition. West Park lift station, this will be a, a replacement or, and upgrading, updating of the existing lift station that is located in City Park. Digester cover renovation, this is a replacement of a, a couple of the, the covers of a couple of the digesters down at the wastewater plant, again, just in poor condition at the end of their useful life. Can I talk about this one? Uh, the digester complex. So this this is uh, a project that's driven by um, some of the nutrient removal that's being done through the sludge process, uh, mainly phosphorus. So it's creating a, product, uh, a byproduct called struvite, which is plugging up all the piping. Um, this will also uh, so so this project will look at the process to remove that struvite. Um, we'll also be looking at the potential uh, as we uh, look at the methane gas production and ways of reuse of potentially incorporating that into this project also. I certainly know what a digester is, but just for the public, could you explain what is a digester? So, so the digester, so the, the byproduct that's created um, during the, the treatment process is sludge, um, and, and so in these digesters, that sludge is broken down so that there's no more um, uh, potential for for ill health results of that. Um, that that product that, that breaks down into what we call biosolids, and that's actually land applied land applied um, through some farm fields on the southern side of Iowa City. Terrific. That was a good environmental project. The influent rake and screen replacement. So this is kind of the first line of defense for the the wastewater plant. Uh, again, it's reached the end of its useful life and more or less replacement of what's there. The Hawkeye Lift Station rehabilitation project, uh, similar to the, the previous one, this is one that will be uh, replaced or updated uh, with a new lift station in this location. The rare at South Sewer, so this is near or will cross Mormon Trek, will also extend sewer along Abbey Lane across Highway 218. The significant, or the significance of this project really is that this is one of the main hurdles for development west of Highway 218. So this has kind of been that sticking point of once the sanitary sewer uh, crosses the, the highway here, then that would potentially open up development of the Carson Farm area um, on the west side of 218. Is that, would that be gravity fed? Yes. And it's within the um, well, the development area, the plan development area of the. It's city. been part of the lo uh, the long term plan of the the sewer system. Right now, we're we're kind of reaching capacity on our west side in terms of buildable lots. The mm -hmm. the Country Club Estate subdivision is going through their last phase. Camp Cardinal is starting to to fill out. After those two areas build out more, we really don't have much growth on the west side. So th that project's out a few years. I think it was in the fourth or fifth mm -hmm. year of our CIP, but it really looks at that next growth um, opportunity on our west side. And with that comes a lot of discussions about um, other needs. So are there school sites needed? Are we looking at a west side recreation center? Uh, there's a large stormwater um, uh, uh, detention basin that's needed uh, for that side. Whole number of things will require a lot of master planning, uh, but this is at least the identifying the dollars to get that sewer underneath 18 to 18. Yeah, there's no neighborhood commercial area out there. The nearest one is where the Fairview grocery store is. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of work that has to be done on that. And again, this form-based code that we're developing for Opticos or with Opticos's help could be very beneficial for that area. Uh, First Avenue water main replacement, uh, really just water main replacement of these two blocks just south of Court Street. Spruce Street water main, again, replacement a couple blocks of water main that uh, has a history of, of breaks. 
Uh, so as, as nutrient um, and nutrient loading nitrogen starts becoming an issue for us in the Iowa River, which, uh, which then, let, you know, the Iowa River basically is our, our source water, whether it's through direct removal or through our um, collector wells that we use. Um, what we're seeing is as, as nitrogen levels increase in the river, they're not returning back to the lower levels that they were. And so um, the, this uh, project will be uh, investigating what we can do to deal with the nitrogen uh, removal or, or other ways to offset the nitrogen in our uh, source water. Dill Street water main replacement. This is, again, is a water main replacement project, but along with that, we'll look at installing sidewalk on one side of Dill Street. This is an area that currently doesn't have sidewalk. If you're familiar with the area, it will be challenging to add sidewalk in this location, so I think that's why we're focused on one side of the street. Again, just to try and provide that pedestrian connection from Rocky Shore to the adjacent neighborhood. Bradford Drive water main replacement. This will be replacement of water main just north of Southeast Junior High. Uh, the water distribution pressure zone improvements. We, we worked on a study with HDR uh, to look at pressure zoning of our system. Um, with this uh, study, uh, they've identified basically two pressure zones for us. One would be kind of the northeast uh, part of our community, uh, and then the, the remainder of the community would be uh, would be in a different pressure zone. Um, the the reasoning for this is as we look at the east side of our, the northeast side of our community, because of the elevation being about the same as the elevation of our water plant, we have issues with being able to keep the pressures up to service these areas. Um, so with this um, project, they've identified where we need to add pieces of infrastructure to, to separate the, the pressure zones. Um, this helps fund those pieces, but we're also um, using other projects, uh, American Legion Road, uh, the First Avenue Water Main Project, to also uh, implement th the features into the system that we need to create that pressure zone. The Jordan Well Rehabilitation Project will uh, basically make improvements to the, it's shown in the blue there up at the water plant, the Jordan Well. Forest Avenue water replacement, again, uh, replacement of a block of water main. Collector well capacity improvement, so this will focus on collector well one. Uh, we'll replace the collector well, also look at ways to improve the capacity of the collector well. Highway one water main replacement will include our uh, reconstruction of a stretch of water main there kind of across the street from Walmart. Jason, I want to toss you a softball. So why do we need to replace water mains? Uh, a lot of times it's in areas where we have a history of water main breaks. So it gets to, sometimes it's due to age, sometimes it's just due to, we have certain eras where construction methods of the time resulted in, in sections of pipe that just result in, in more maintenance. Uh, oftentimes that's water main breaks. Thanks. Well, that kind of answers my question. I think we've talked about that before. You don't necessarily wait until there's an issue that the, the water main's broken. It's just kind of the history of it, and maybe uh, if you know the date of when it was actually installed, you're thinking it's, it's outliving. Yep. It's, and it's, and it's, a lot of times it's, yeah, we get a, a pretty good idea of we start seeing patterns of certain era of pipe or a type of pipe that's be, being used where if we see a history of breaks, then we'll be more proactive with replacement of those areas. And are you routinely looking at this, I'm assuming, uh, for areas to replace it? Correct. Yep. It's an ongoing process. The high service pump VFD replacement, this replaces the variable frequency drives on the high service pumps and just really makes them more efficient um, during pumping operations. The Peninsula Wellfield Power Redundancy. So now that the Peninsula neighborhood has been built out, this allows for basically uh, an additional power feed to this area um, that will allow for essentially a loop system. So should something happen, it will allow for some redundancy there. Excuse me, uh, Jeff has, uh, am I right in thinking that Peninsula is now fully built out or is there like one lot left or something? You know? pretty, pretty darn close if it's not full. 
I was wondering if they're going to have a celebration about, you know, completing the project. If there is, I'd like to go. <laughs> I have not heard anything, but I'll let you know. <laughs> I, I once assigned students to go out there when it was still a, the remnants of a farm, and they did things like collected uh, um, bedrock, soil samples, water samples, walked all over the place. I camped out there, well, sort of camped out there one night in the middle of winter. It was really great fun. Uh, that was before the peninsula development was built, of course. <laughs> The chlorine feeder system, so this will be an upgrade to the water plant and really replacing the existing system. With that, that's it for public works, so we'll move on to airport. I did have one question. Um, so the First Avenue and Scott Boulevard, they're getting the roundabout, yep. as well as um, American Legion Road and Scott Boulevard, they're both getting the roundabout. Um, so with like Scott American Legion Road and Scott Boulevard, seem like there's um, the school is there, and there's neighborhoods there, and um, and I know I've been on the uh, First Avenue, you know, trying to get through there at like um, high volume times, and it seems challenging to get through there. Um, has there been studies done about roundabout? I'm assuming there. I mean, you've done roundabout studies uh, versus uh, lights. Um, do you find that that's going to really f move traffic at a nice pace, or would would lights be more advantageous? I, I think what you're going to find is certainly there's been some analysis that's been completed. I think what you're going to find is that during those peak times, there's still going to be some delay and some queuing that occurs uh, where you really see the benefit is those off-peak times. So I, I think it'll still move traffic during those peak times, but really during the off-peak times, you'll be able to have essentially free flow, whereas for signals, you're still going to have times where even if there's not other people there, you're having to stop to wait for the light to change or, or whatever. So I think overall, it's going to be an improvement, um, but certainly it's not going to be a situation where there's there's no queuing or delay. I think maybe more, if we see more and more in our community, because they're really new and uh, people are just stalled, they don't know what to do, I, myself included. Um, and so I think right now, even when they're in use from people within our community, um, they may not be going at the, at the pace that they could be going. Um, because people don't, you know, they don't quite know who who has the right of way to go and all that other stuff. But um, I just wondered about that because um, those, you know, those high use times um, can be a little frustrating. Um, but I, I do get the point of, you know, the benefits when it's not that peak time. Jason, isn't there also a substantial environmental benefit from the roundabout that you're not having as much acceleration when you're moving? Sure, and, and whether yeah. it's queuing or whatever, emissions are certainly cut down when you're not having people just sitting at intersections. But I think to that point, there's certainly an education component that goes with that, and I think as you do get more, people become more familiar with them and they become uh, more popular. I think there's two things with those, to Bruce's point. One, that the roundabout itself is physically large enough. Um, so you, you've got that radius that there's actually some space. Well, we've talked about one in the area that's really small, <laughs> not in Iowa City. And two, I've seen them in other cities where they actually put up signs that simply say, yield to the left. And so people gradually get the idea of, okay, I don't need to look at the right. I just need to see what's coming from my left and yield to any cars coming around. So I think that could be helpful as well. And both of these are intended to be full size roundabouts, not minis or Good. other designs. <laughs> yeah, traffic circles. I have to say the first time I ever saw a roundabout was in Hilton Head. Um, and I was scared to death <laughs> because they were going really fast. <laughs> well, having had driver's ed many, many, many years ago prior to roundabouts, I, I think there are a lot of us in that age range that, that don't know for sure. And, and I have seen the signs that say yield to the left, and I think that would be extremely helpful. 
All right, everybody, let's remember we're leaving at 345. All right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, we're just fine. Well, uh, good afternoon. I'm Mike Tharp. I'm the airport operations specialist. Um, as Dennis alluded to earlier uh, when he was given the overview of the presentation with airport projects, um, our funding sources are basically three three areas. We get $100,000 from uh, the general levy, which we use for matching grants. Uh, those grants come from either the state DOT or the Federal Aviation Administration. And when the, the FAA, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration, participates, we get Get, uh, they give us 90% of the project cost. When the state participates at the DOT level, it's anywhere from 70 to 85% of the project cost, depending on, on the uh, uh, particular grant and the particular project. Because of that, when we don't get funded via grants, those projects usually just shift down the line, and that's that's what you've probably seen a, a great deal of, or, or moved around somewhat in, in that uh, project matrix, where the, the you can see that change, uh, changes over the last few years. Uh, with the projects that we've got on the list, uh, the first one, the airport parking lot expansion. This is one just to try to increase the av availability of parking spaces at the terminal building when we have uh, days where we have heavy charter use, or even when we're trying to host, uh, you know, community meetings, community events. Uh, parking is at a premium, so we're trying to d do a couple of projects there to just increase the, the availability of parking spaces uh, close to the building. Um, the airfield pavement rehab. This is actually our last section of 1950s era of pavement. Um, you know, it's it's a pavement that's in not great condition. It's it's definitely watermarked or weather weather uh, weathermarked and and does have some cracking and and, and we're seeing some joint uh, uh, joint uh, unraveling uh, with it. So we're going to take that out and replace it. Um, uh, Project number three and four, both of these kind of tie together. This is uh, coming from the, the airport's master plan, and this one is to add about 210, 215 feet to the end of runway seven. What that uh, what that pavement does is if you're landing on the opposite direction, you actually get a full 5,000 foot of landing distance that you can use for uh, aircraft landing calculations. Um, uh, runway 25, uh, this is one that's coming from our, again, from our F, uh, airport master plan and as part of the broader obstruction mitigation projects, but because we've uh, changed some design criteria based on the airport's usage over the last 20 years, um, we're able to shift the landing threshold back about 700 feet and reclaim some of that existing pavement for landing calculations. Uh, the runway 12303, again, coming from the, the master plan, uh, this is a project that, that ties into some of our obstruction mitigation. Uh, we are displacing the threshold on the northwest uh, side of the airport about 500 feet in order to kind of maintain the, the same landing distance that's on that runway. We're going to add pavement to the opposite end uh, to keep those calculations going. And self-serve fuel kiosks, this is one that we went after state grants uh, last year and unfortunately weren't funded, but we may try again. Um, uh, the, the fuel system kiosk right now just needs to be updated so it can better handle the, 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 the chips and the cards and uh, that kind of source. Right now it's just a magnetic feed uh, uh, point of sale system. In our apron expansion, this is our larger expansion. You can see in the picture the two colors of the pavement. Uh, that smaller section was added last year in preparation for this uh, for the, the rehab project. But this one is, is a, a much larger one so that we can better accommodate, especially the larger aircraft that come in. If we get a, a, a kind of the max end of our a, 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 a ability to handle aircraft, it can take up anywhere from a third to a quarter of our ramp. So it, it really cuts down on, on the available parking for other aircraft that might show up. And that's the airport projects. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Howdy. Good afternoon, John Greer, Fire Chief. Mine are pretty straightforward mm. for stuff. Our apparatus, apparatus replacement program, we've, uh, you'll notice in your document that you have, we did switch some things around. So for uh, 20, we have coming up the replacement of an engine and our safety house. And then in 22, that would be a replacement of our quint, which is a ladder type device. And then in 23 would be our actual aerial device for 1.9 million. 
And then the other one I have on there is Fire Station 5, that lot purchase we just uh, did not too long ago. So I'd entertain any questions you might have. One super quick question. One of the things that pops up in urban planning questions a lot are the size of fire um, trucks mm -hmm. themselves. And um, for um, the peninsula, do we have smaller trucks for that area? Um, is that something we look at in terms of possibly looking at smaller trucks? Trucks, Because when you talk about street width, that usually comes up as an issue um, in terms of the size of fire trucks. And obviously, you have reasonable concerns. We all want to make sure we can access it. Is, is that something that comes up or, or you think about? Yeah, it has come up more in the recent past, yes. Okay. So it's it's on our radar for this next round of purchases as far as the engines. Okay. It seems the bigger your engine gets, the more you put on it, and I think some of it we could probably not carry, and we're our cognizant of the shrinking street. Yep. We are able to access all the streets. Sometimes it just takes a little uh, maneuvering. Because you, you guys always get a hard time a lot about the fire chief expressing concern, so I just thought I'd bring that up. <laughs> yes. You do a great job. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. That was easy. Hey, thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Ellsworth Carmen, Library Director. We're going to keep this short and sweet as well. Um, we've got two projects to talk about. The first is uh, the first half of a carpeting and furnishing upgrade at the library. This will be on the second floor. Um, just for context, the carpet and furnishing is original to the 2004 building. Um, I think it's a testament to our building maintenance crews that it's in the shape it's in. Um, so mostly wear and tear, but also interestingly, we know much more about how furnishings affect access now, and the pattern that we chose that was chosen in 2004 actually could be a barrier for some folks coming in the building because it has a sort of a 3D pattern. Um, so we'll know better for, for selecting this next time. Um, and the second one is a uh, continuation of the HVAC repairs. This is just um, expected and general operational maintenance. Okay, Any questions? Doc. Any questions for Howard? Pretty easy. Thanks. Thanks. Why don't you skip through the yeah. senior center and go to the next one? She's sitting out here. She's out here. She has a citizen. Oh, there she is. Mm. Everywhere I go, what are you talking to? Hi, Latasha. Hi. My apologies. I'll be here for 90 seconds. Mm. Um, so the senior center uh, for this uh, fiscal year, we have a plaster issue. If you've been to our grand staircase, you know we have some plaster coming uh, down um, that we need to get that repaired as well as there's a window with some water retention happening in there. And then also to specifically look at um, doing some type of ADA study to make sure our building is really being able to do what it is that we need to specifically for our population, but the community in general. So those are our to ask that we have for uh, uh, an uh, amendment for this year. Do we have to do 2022? Yeah. Okay. Um, for the uh, next year, we're looking at, we have some of the oldest carpet in um, <laughs> probably the city. Um, some of our carpet is over 40 years old. And so just thinking about health um, issues that can happen, especially as people have lung issues, et cetera. I mean, our staff does an amazing job of trying to maintain and keep it clean, but I just know even in my office is about uh, 40 years old carpeting, so we have some requests for carpets, um, and we need to start looking at um, some kitchen redesign. I know you all know we have a kind of a defunct kitchen, but um, there are some ideas of how do we make that kitchen more accessible as a rentable space for small businesses or uh, as a catering kitchen, a space where our public can use it. Um, so there's some uh, thought about getting someone to come in, uh, some contractors and some, some design happening to, to look at it um, so that we can come up with 
with a good plan about how we can better utilize city uh, facility, um, as well as is that a revenue opportunity for the senior center? Um, is that an opportunity to build some intergenerational programming, um, et cetera, that we kind of have in mind to utilize in that space? And then there's some other building repairs, some wallpaper, painting, uh, different things that we're looking at in 2020. Um, we have four floors, so there's a lot of this is mostly just um, building, uh, uh, removal of um, some paint, and then our hope is to eventually, as uh, time goes on, to start looking at some of the exterior of our building, um, trying to uh, kind of uh, reflect the vibrancy of what's happening inside the building on the outside of the building uh, a little bit more with potentially putting in some um, uh, I'm track, I'm losing the word, <laughs> but to do some, some more with our uh, landscaping so that people can understand a little bit more, maybe being more clear about what the center is. Um, so there's a little bit of outside work, but that's further down as we're looking um, into it. Um, those those are mostly our main our main goals is to get the building updated. Um, just because it's an older building, it doesn't have to go without the repair that's needed. And I don't think we've asked for a CIP request. I don't think in a really really long time. Uh, at least looking back at our files. So this is kind of our first time really saying we really need to make some changes and to do some things. Um, eventually at some point, um, I think we're also going to have to look at. Um, replacing our elevator because it's been there for a really, really long time as well. So um, some, a lot of these things are about safety. Some of them are definitely looking at, you know, improving the look, updating the look, but some of them are in regards to safety. Can I just comment on the kitchen? I was so glad you, to hear you say that because that's going to be huge. Yeah. I think that's going to be a really <laughs> exciting project. I know Muzza here and I have talked a lot about possible Robert A. Lee. Mm -hmm. There are some complexities with making that happen at Robert A. Lee, mm -hmm. but in terms of the food entrepreneurs, community programming, I think and the location, I'm so excited uh, that you guys are proposing that. So I'm re really excited to see what you have in store for that particular project. Yeah, we. I, I'm really excited about it that it could potentially, my goal is it would be really great to do a cooking show like what does that look like to know how YouTube? to make yes we are we already got YouTube we, we have senior center TV so we already have the staff that's available to do that but to partner with local chefs or folks that want to come in and show how to make some meals and kind of combine that with our pantry that we've opening um, how does it to make a low-budget meal um, to kind of stretch your dollars. So just some ideas there about like how we can incorporate the use of that kitchen as well as potentially some some small entrepreneurs who need a space uh, later in the evening, afternoon when we're not utilizing it. So those are just some ideas on the table. Obviously, there's we're open to other ideas and suggestions about what that looks like, but getting someone to come in specifically to kind of give us an idea of how we can do that um, will be really helpful. Do you all currently use the commercial kitchen? So, <laughs> not really. So we have the space, we have uh, these refrigerators and things, but they're not up to date, We're, they're not in use. So right now, the only use of the kitchen is our sanitation space, uh, which is still functioning and fine. Um, and then we have a refrigerator, but that's with our collaboration with Elder Services to specifically pr still provide our, our meals at the noon hour. Um, so they have a refrigerator that that's in there. So some of that stuff in there is theirs as well because it kind of got left over from when that contract kind of changed. So we'll be working with them also about what to do with those items as well as how we can update that space um, to actually get a functioning stove and refrigerator, uh, et cetera. I think it'd also be a great space as we look to potentially in the future partnering with public health if there's ever a disaster that we can have a place specifically for um, elders in our community to go to get medication etc so that's also a part of hoping to put that in a plan about how do, how do we become a, a point of distribution site um, down the line that we can help if there's ever a disaster so we'll need a functioning area for refrigeration um, but that's the reason I some conversation the reason I asked is because um, it sounded like you were planning um, if there was going to be used for the community to come in it would be after hours when the senior, mm -hmm. when, the, when the center is using it. And so currently there um, is uh, 
a um, agency in town that allow uh, entrepreneurs to go in. Um, but the challenge that I've been told is that they have to go in super early or after like five o'clock. Mm -hmm. And so most catering uh, businesses, they need to be typically during the day, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was one of the challenges. So just keep, I wanted to just mention that okay. because that is uh, something that's been told to me by um, uh, a few people that want, that, that do have a catering business mm -hmm. and they have a challenge in finding time a, a usable commercial space. Okay. I mean, it's definitely something we can look at right now. It's it's mostly being used to just be able to serve food out of during that noon hour. So it's not being utilized in the morning. It's not being utilized in the afternoon. So I think there there could be some possibilities. Obviously, I need to find more details. I'm not trying to sell y'all something that I don't know about. Sure. <laughs> so I'm just saying that, you know, we're open to whatever we can do um, to make that space uh, available because it is quite a bit of square footage that we could be utilizing. Well, the one good thing is that there is somebody already doing it. So that will be a connection for you. Yes, great. Please and let I'm me know that is. And I'm assuming it will be a licensed kitchen, right? Well, yeah, oh, well, yeah we would have to just, yes. just in general if we're going to do that, if we're going to go there. Yeah, right. if we're going to allow somebody else to come yeah, cook and, and sell their food. So it have to be a licensed kitchen. Yeah. So there's some work and some challenges of getting that up to date. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Thank Natasha. You. Okay. Yeah. Great job. Well, Chief Matherly's coming up. Um, uh, uh, Latasha's comment about a plaster repair reminds me that of a job apprentice opportunity. There are lots of older buildings in Iowa City that need plaster repair on the interior, and there's only one person who does plaster repair in Iowa City, and that one person is something like 80 years old. Uh, so it would be great if, as an economic development kind of uh, activity, we would reach out to that one individual and try to find some way to get an apprentice or more than one apprentice to work with him. Okay, Chief. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, Jody Matherly, Police Chief. Uh, we have three projects that we're looking at. Um, we've spent a lot of time looking at the, uh, the physical structure of our, our building, uh, the efficiency of the building, and then technology related to that. Uh, some of the things we found are um, <clears throat> that we need to improve on a more visitor-friendly design that incorporates safety as a priority. We have no interview rooms. Folks that come in to talk to us, make a complaint, have to sit in an officer report area near the break room, and so there's just no privacy and safety there for anybody. Um, the interior space for training in meeting rooms, we've evaluated um, the uh, areas for appropriate and secure prisoner movement, uh, fingerprinting and detention are substandard, uh, lack of storage and records uh, space. We have two off-site storage areas, as you well know, that we deal with uh, for evidence and things of that nature, and then just room for staff and expansion. Much of this is not going to be addressed through uh, some of the remodeling that we're talking about now. It'll take a new facility for that, but we know that's way down the road, but um, uh, we're able to do some of these things that are relatively inexpensive cost right now and still enhance safety and efficiency and make it more accommodating for our customers, those who come in and talk to us. So that's the first project here. Um, uh, this, these are all 2019 projects, by the way. But there's three offices as you walk in our, our front entrance. Uh, the watch commander's office, where the supervisors sit uh, for patrol. And then two officer report writing rooms, which is really where we talk to our, our, our uh, um, community members that come in. So we're going to remodel the three of those to make them into uh, two interview rooms that will have some privacy in the technology uh, that's related to uh, taking proper uh, complaints and reports, and then uh, update the, the watch commander's office and also the officer's report writing room. Uh, there will be some funding from another source through our abandoned money funds that was targeted several years ago for building improvements, and so we'll use some of that money with this project as well. The next thing is the, um, the body camera replacement. So we, we use a system now that's antiquated. It's eight years old. It's no longer supported by the manufacturer. So it's time to replace the in-car camera systems. Um, our body cameras are just three or four years old, but those really take a beating. Um, they have new systems now where the body camera talks to the car camera. So if I activate the body camera, the car camera turns on and vice versa. So there's less chance of saying I had to jump out of my police car 
chase after a person and I didn't have a chance to activate this. If I activate one, it'll activate the other. There's also systems out there that are recording in the background. So if I do not have a chance to activate my body camera or the car camera, these systems are still recording and we can go back and download off the hard drive and still get that information if we need it. So it, it, it kind of uh, takes the, takes the, uh, the, the, uh, the chance that we have unrecorded incidents happening, which really enhances things for us and, and it also makes things more transparent for our community. So those are the new systems we're looking at for this project. And then the last one is crime scene mapping. We have what's called, um, uh, it's a total station. So it's really designed initially for, for engineers and, and things of that nature for road construction projects. Um, it's worked well for evidence scenes, but it's it's labor intensive, uh, it takes a lot of manpower, and also just takes a lot of time. The new systems, it's almost a one to two person show, and literally will do within minutes what has taken us hours with the old system. And these systems are designed to measure crime scenes to scale and be able to reproduce it in the courtroom and use it for investigation. So we're really looking forward to that. Half of this project is also going to be funded by the University of Iowa Police Department, who's budgeted, and then we'll have a, an MOU to share this device. So it's not just sitting idle that the two agencies are using it in a shared concept. So it'll save us some money. That's all I have. Chief, what will happen to the replaced camera systems? Um, you know, because they're not supported in, anymore, uh, that's a good question. It's not, that wouldn't be good for resale. We could maybe find a small agency that says we'll use them until they absolutely die uh, and, and do that. But short of that, uh, somebody that, that really is dependent upon these devices and are going to use them ongoing, uh, they wouldn't be worth a whole lot to anybody because of their age. So you'd give it to Ron? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I just want to ask you about the, something really unrelated. The, the body camera that the police have, is this um, something like you record and download it later, or it could be live with the department or something like that? So the, these are not uh, designed to be live uh, at all. Um, they are downloaded automatically when we return to the station. So when uh, they, we get back and we, we dock the body cameras or with the cars, just parking them, then they're wireless, wirelessly, easy for me to say, downloaded into the system. Um, so we don't have the, uh, the ability to, to sit there and watch them live at this point. Um, there are systems that could do that. That's a whole different uh, system, but, but these aren't designed to do that. Okay. But we can absolutely bring them up within minutes of, of recording if we, if we needed to. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Okay. Thank you. Darian, phase two. <laughs> Hello there. I thought I would start with our parking projects. First one is the EMV parking equipment. I had to look up what EMV means, and it means Euro MasterCard Visa. And it's adopting the, of course, European standards for the chip technology, which we're starting to see widespread. Um, there's been a lot of chatter in the last couple years about um, whether the requirement will come for us to be um, chip friendly in all of our parking facilities. The requirement hasn't come yet, but this project is to prepare us so when that comes, we have the funds to retrofit the equipment if need be. Uh, truth be told, we'd rather let our equipment age out. And then as we purchase new equipment, of course, that, um, that EMV or that chip technology will be included in that new equipment. The second project is the rec center a parking lot overlay and creek improvements. And this is consolidating a few different needs and a few different um, more or less projects in, in the one project. And this would be a redesign and a reconfiguration of the rec center parking lot um, to improve circulation. Also, um, it would include stabilization of the Ralston Creek Bank, which is right along the parking lot's edge. And it would also involve resurfacing of the parking lot, which is um, the parking lot seems better day. So it's sort of wrapping all of those three needs into one project. 
Uh, the third project is just a uh, replacement of our electronics and our smart parking meters. They look like your average parking meter, but now they have brains, and um, we're able to use them with our use credit cards with them. We're able to use Passport, and they each have a, a little computer um, that uploads to the internet um, for all transactions. And in a few years, they're going to be reaching the end of their useful life. So this project is planning for their eventual replacement. The casing seem to be holding up pretty well, but um, we're anticipating that we're going to need to replace that electronic equipment. How often do, do they need replaced? This would be the first replacement, um, and by 2021, which is when this project is slated for, they will be about 10 years old. Uh, the fourth project is video cameras for our parking facilities, and this is sort of a um, twofold project as well, um, both for you know safety and security. But we also um, are seeking ways that we can um, we can elevate our ungated facilities, say across the street at Chauncey Swan, so that we have some of the benefits of our gated facilities, but without the gates, so people can drive in and out. Um, for example, you can do license plate uh, permits, things like that. Um, so this is a project that would help us um, to um, control, better control the facility, especially with all the growth in the area at our ungated facilities, and also provide that security as well. well I, I don't understand. What, what, what is the particular benefit that would in order to you or the, or the facility with the um, video? So it could be... A, it, the gated versus un, ungated. Okay. Um, you could use cameras not just to record what's happening, but they could be license plate reader cameras as well. So when a car enters a facility, for anyone who has a parking permit, for example, across the street, um, you would drive into the ramp. Um, if you have a city permit, we would read your license plate with the camera. It would know, the system would know you're parked there and you have a permit and you're allowed to be there. If you're not, if you're just a guest, say I don't have a parking permit and I drive in, it reads my license plate and it knows within 15 minutes we should expect a transaction at one of our pay on foot stations. Okay. So and, then and it aids in enforcement. Th that's actually a very significant issue. Do we have privacy? We're not uploading those, that license plate information to any other law enforcement agency. That would not be used to track, correct? Because anytime no. someone talks about license plate reading, privacy alarm bells, I think, going off. Sure. So this would just be just related to payment to ensure that payment occurs. It would not be shared with law enforcement, correct? Well, I guess that's to be determined. Um, the, the capacity would be there. I mean, in terms of sharing with, with police enforcement. In, in other words, would this be it, all of a sudden you get a report on a license plate number? Um, we would then share this with other agencies. Uh, I guess that's a good okay. question. Well, that's something I'm going to follow up. Yeah, on. I haven't, th I hadn't thought that through, but it was from our perspective. I think that primarily it would allow us to control. Um, it would allow all the benefits, the user benefits of having an ungated system, um, meaning you don't have to stop in Just front in of the gate, of the get payment. your ticket. Yeah, yeah. it makes it more efficient to get in and out of the system, and it allows us to um, use it for parking enforcement. Rockney, I, I would follow up on that. I don't. Uh, we haven't had any conversations about directly feeding that and proactively looking for uh, violations other than uh, uh, parking violations. Um, but we do we, we we do have a need um, to to better monitor our decks for public safety purposes. We've had uh, several incidents in decks, and then we've had some very high profile cases where cameras in the decks um, could have really helped our police investigation. So some of the um, recent murder cases involved trying to track vehicles around decks. So there may be cases in which investigations lead us to to want to access some of the, those those cameras and, and look for that stuff. Um, certainly as we get more into the planning for this particular project, we can have that public discussion. Frankly, we're going to have to have some of that discussion here soon as we get ready to, to launch some of the downtown uh, public safety cameras that we're proposing. Yep, but I can follow up. Yeah, sure. You mean like unless there is a problem, you're not going to go and investigate all those split Correct. and find out. Okay. 
uh, the number five project is parking enforcement vehicles. And this is, um, this is an example of one of our current vehicles that's got license plate reader technology that we just use for, to determine if there's um, vehicles in, the, it's basically used for parking enforcement is what I should say. So we're hoping to expand um, to another parking enforcement vehicle with this license plate technology. And that would also help us uh, improve our enforcement in our, and again, in our ungated facility. So this would be more or less partnered with the cameras in the ungated facilities to help improve our enforcement and make it more efficient. And we could also use it for street storage and odd even parking and, and some to help address some of our neighborhood parking issues in the near downtown areas. And the last project in terms of parking is simply just updating our automated parking equipment. Um, it's been about 10 years, maybe 11 years by the time we get to this project that we automated our first facility and I think it's been very successful. Um, it helps people get in and out faster. Um, there's been many reasons it's been great but the equipment is aging out and so we have um, a project to uh, ramp by ramp start to replace that equipment. About 10 years is about the expected lifespan. We're at a point now where we're starting to invest a lot more staff time um, due to customer service issues related to our equipment. So I think we're we're experiencing sort of the backside of uh, the efficiency and the savings with the with the equipment. So it's really getting time um, to make these make these equipment upgrades. All right, moving on to transit. Uh, number seven is our uh, transit equipment facility relocation. So this project involves uh, construction of a new transit and equipment facility for our maintenance operations and storage. Um, the storage area, the plan is to expand, expand the storage area, allowing for increased fleet size. We're really hamstrung at this current point. We've, um, we can't expand at all at our current location. We are, uh, based on our building size, we just aren't able to expand. We've outgrown it. Um, the equipment has reached the end of its useful life, the built-in equipment um, at the facility. And um, due to the subsidence issues on the property, we're not really able to expand um, to accommodate future growth for our transit facility. So that's why we have a transit facility project uh, within the CIP. This is also a project where we are actively seeking federal funds. Um, we did submit a grant proposal last August. We did not receive that grant, um, but we're going to keep at it. So this is, um, this is, we'll just keep looking for federal funds where we can find them under whichever rock we can find them under. So we're staying on the case. Um, again, due to the substance issues, uh, this is our transit facility parking lot asphalt overlay. Um, you can see this is the, I can't remember if this is the back of the, this looks like the back of the building. Because of the subsidence issues, we have to periodically keep putting down asphalt so that the buses do not get hung up um, as the land around uh, the actual building sinks. So we um, have to come through every few years and just lay down some more asphalt so that um, the buses can get in and out easily. So that's what this project is. Uh, transit mobile column lift. If you can believe it, we have lifts. The lift bus is just like that. Um, the one that we're using currently is in our facility, and it was original with the 1983 facility, and it's reaching, certainly reaching the end of its useful life, and we're getting to the point where we're afraid we will not be able to repair it if we, can't, we won't be able to find re replacement pieces for it, more or less. Um, this is why the transit mobile column vehicle lift would be um, we have wise purchase at this point because we can move this. We could replace our one in our facility currently, but when we um, eventually hopefully get a new facility, this can go with it. So it's a piece that we'd be able to move um, rather than uh, duplicating that expenditure. And last but not least, uh, the Muscatine Avenue pedestrian and transit amenities. Um, we've heard concerns from pedestrians in the Muscatine corridor, and we're talking east of First Avenue that it can be difficult to get across the street north and south. Um, there's not a lot of um, dedicated um, crossings. And um, so this project really ties in two things. One, it's, it's um, installing an accessible mid-block crosswalk with pedestrian, excuse me, pedestrian refuge area on Muscatine between Wade and Williams. So this is more or less adjacent to the hy V and also um, installing new bus shelters at this location. So it would really help increase the pedestrian amenities and the transit amenities in a very high use corridor. Okay, any questions for Darian? Okay, thank thank you. you. 
Hi there. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the one finance project we have, and and uh, this is an IT project. It's a citywide software project um, for an infrastructure asset management system. Like I said, it's a, a software package that uh, we're really uh, working jointly with the Public Works Department on, and and it's uh, in order to track uh, the underground utilities uh, and other infrastructure assets, uh, track maintenance, replacement, and this will help coordinate uh, the management of those assets citywide. Um, and we currently do not have a single citywide management system, and so this will really uh, work across all the departments and also work with our geographical uh, geographical information uh, excuse me geographical information system. And I don't know if you want to add anything, Jason or Ron, to that. No. So. Currently, our water division uses Cartograph, which is, you know, it, is, is that is a system which, uh, as, as we look at vendors, would be a potential vendor for the system. Um, but we have, in public works, we have two intense users, and that's for our sign inventory, and then also the, the water division. And so, as we as we move into a better way to, you know, where our facilities are, but then also know what the life, um, dealing with water main breaks, it, it's been a, a huge asset um, for us there. Uh, but then also, as, as we look at expanding those systems, um, being able to pass that information on to the designers. Okay. Okay. What's next? Uh, you're familiar with this one. This is the Behavioral Access Center. Uh, you see a total cost of $6.5 million. That's just an estimate. Our contribution is only $2.5 million, and that's <clears throat> cash on hand, ready to go uh, when all the agreements are worked out. Are there any um, recurring uh, contributions to the uh, Behavior Access Center? Uh, not that's been discussed okay. to, to date. I think all of their services should be billable, um, with the exception of maybe one or two of them, but most of the services would be billable. They're still working through that yes. a lot. Ag yeah. Agreed. <laughs> So the last section is the on the radar section. So these are the projects that aren't in the current plan, but they're ones that we see as significant projects coming up in the next five, 10 plus or minus years. Um, first one being the Burlington Street Bridge. Um, this was one that we actually had looked at potential federal funding for a, a grant program. Um, in the end, it, it ended up not being a good fit and didn't receive um, funding with that program. But what we'd be looking at here is, uh, as you may be aware, there's actually two bridges in this location. The north one is actually the DOT's bridge. The south one is the city-owned bridge. Um, so what we would look at is improvements here, potentially combining those. So going with one structure would be a joint project with the DOT. Um, we've had preliminary discussions with them to see if that might be a good fit. It seems like at this point they'd be receptive, at least in, in having that conversation. Um, there's also with the dam and university utilities, city utilities, there's a lot of stuff going on in that corridor. So um, we'll be a significant project when it comes time. Um, and I think as far as funding, we'd probably be looking um, in the ballpark of what was with the recent Park Road bridge um, that was completed. Not necessarily the same design, but it's going to be that scale of project. McAllister Boulevard, as we mentioned earlier, the extension from Gilbert Street to Sycamore, this would be the next section to the east, so it would extend McAllister from Sycamore to Scott Boulevard. Park Road reconstruction, this is one that unfortunately didn't make it in the program, but this is one that we, especially with the uh, recent completion or, or significant portions of the Gateway project being complete, this is one that gets a fair amount of attention from time to time from local residents of needing uh, significant work from pavement as well as some utility upgrades in the area. This one has been mentioned a little bit as well. This is the Car Carson Lake Regional Storm Sewer. So this would be a, a regional storm, uh, stormwater basin. Um, that, again, this is south of Raritt, uh, west of Highway 218. As that development occurs, I think the plan really is a, a regional stormwater facility in this area.
Taft Avenue reconstruction. Um, this again is one that comes up from time to time. We receive comments, complaints um, about the current condition of Taft Avenue. We've actually split it into kind of three sections. I think with whatever project we end up doing would likely have to be broken up into segments, um, but that would be all the way from Herbert Hoover Highway down to 420th Street. Um, currently it's a, a rural section. There's portions that are chip seal, portions that are gravel. Um, those would be, this project would include reconstruction of that to an urban standard. The Highway 6 trail from Broadway to Sycamore Street, this would really be extending uh, pedestrian and, and trail facilities along the high, south side of Highway 6, um, again, for this stretch. A couple of the parks ones on this. The first one is Eastside Sports Complex, um, as we talked about before. Uh, it has a master plan that was done in 2015 or completed in 2015. Uh, the site sits out there. Uh, we'll be doing tree planting, but the question of what, when or what happens there. Lower City Park, also a master plan completed in 2015 um, to flood proof or make it more flood tolerant. We've been slowly doing parts of this plan. Um, the baseball fields had some renovations coming up. The playground is being moved. Um, three of the unused or low use fields were moved out uh, last spring. So we're slowly making progress here, but this uh, plan and the larger project would raise the road and make even more of the park usable no matter or during most flooding situations. Um, this is a general category for swimming pool renovations. And as you know, we have three pools, Robert A. Lee downtown, Mercer Park indoor pool, and then the City Park pool. The City Park pool is one of the oldest pools in the state of Iowa, um, which has been kept operational for a long time. But I just want to have it on the radar screen that eventually, especially Robert A. Lee and City Park pool, will need some um, renovation or some replacement at some point not too far down the road. That's it. I just point out if you, um, and I don't have the exact page on unfunded list, but we have identified dozens and dozens of unfunded projects. These are things that we've identified or perhaps that we've had um, residents call and inquire about. We note those and we try to provide a rough estimate of cost. Uh, so it's it's kind of interesting to flip through. Um, you'll see a lot of projects that I think you'd shake your head and say, yeah, that'd be great if we could do that. And it just goes to show the, um, resources that we could put to use if, if we had. It's page 588. Okay, does anybody have any questions or observations they want to make about the CIP, the draft CIP? I just think staff, as usual, has done a great job of prioritizing, you know, where we need to spend our money. And I think with Dennis's help, trying to put together a CIP program that kind of spreads out our geo bonding, so that we don't have super highs and super lows. Um, I don't know, two or three years out, we've got one that's a little bit lower, but we'll probably find a way to fill it. <laughs> There's always things to do. So I just appreciate the work because. Um, it's kind of like putting together a puzzle. I mean, we have more work to do than we can possibly fund or than we have personnel to handle for a lot of these things. And so it's kind of prioritizing. I'm, I'm glad that we're going to have a consultant come in and help us with kind of the analysis of the streets and maybe maybe a better plan there. I mean, there's things I didn't hear today that, you know, I always hear about Prairie du Chien and, you know, other roads and stuff like that. I hear people complain about Rochester, et cetera. And so to be able to have a little more concrete plan and say, yeah, this analysis has been done. This is kind of when, when that's um, going to be planned out for. But overall, I just really want to thank staff for a great plan. My only comment, too, is I, I feel that the these projects are really spread evenly throughout the community. I, I, you've always done a good job of that, but I think this year really underscores that you really prioritize the needs throughout the community. And as we looked at those, the map and the coloring in terms of the, the numerical projects that you put in here, it really did get the sense that the east side, west side, north side, south side, we really got an equal share of the funds. I think you did a great job of that. Um, also briefly related to the pool, you know, I love our city park pool. I sort of say it's elegant and part of me likes that. Um, 
but it really does need some more stuff. And you think for like young families as they're looking at evaluating whether they move to a community, that experience in a pool is a big part of it. Um, I love going there, but I'm like in my 40s. Um, so hopefully we can get it a little bit more where, you know, the 10 year olds and teenagers will have a few more bells and whistles. I know that will be a long time in the, in the future. Um, and finally, the Burlington Street Bridge. Um, that's sort of what been one of the holy grails for the um, biking community in terms of getting that access. So um, hopefully in the future, you really sort of think about that and work with them. And it's good to see that we have been working with the bike community in terms of these various projects um, to make sure that we're really implementing the, the bike master plan. So um, great work. I second Susan. So I'm struck by a couple of things as usual. One is the from the outside, it's hard to recognize how much money has to go into the maintenance and repair and upgrading of basic infrastructure that has to do with water, sewer, roads, you name it. Um, so it's only by going through a presentation like this that, that we can really get a sense of the, the scope and cost of doing that kind of upgrading and maintenance and repair. So that's one thing. The second thing that leaps out at me is the interaction between the provision of basic infrastructure, water, sewer, roads, and the development of land. So the, 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 the fact that there's that sewer, um, you showed us a, a map of the one sewer crossing over Highway 218 or I-380, whatever it's called, um, is a huge step. I know that there, there are property owners and developers who've been wanting to build on that land. They can't do it without water and sewer. So this opens up a big, big swath of land once that sewer line is built. Likewise, the one that runs by New Hoover and goes southwest from New Hoover School. Again, that opens up land uh, in a particular way. So it's really important to recognize how important those bits of infrastructure are for what happens to the overall shape and form, et cetera, of the city over time. Yeah, those are a couple thoughts that come to mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll add a couple too. It's sort of along the same themes and, and uh, that, that would be, you know, for every asset we have, it's a liability, <laughs> you know, sort of as we expand our our infrastructure and, and address issues such as parks and bike lanes and so forth, uh, all of these have a cost associated with them. And so it becomes a question of managing those liabilities, making sure we have the revenues to maintain them uh, and can keep them in good repair and replace them when necessary in a timely fashion. It's uh, it's kind of a scary situation, I'd have to say. I mean, I, I forget what the overall amount was for the unfunded projects. I was... Uh, it wasn't something million. I, yeah. 342 million. Yeah, it's, it's kind of... It's kind of uh, another million dollars, I'd like to add. And it, it went up quite a bit <laughs> from last year. So... Uh, it's almost, because it's unfunded, we don't really pay a great deal of attention to it. I guess we pay some, but um, uh, these things aren't going away, um, and in fact, their costs are escalating. So um, I'm pleased to see, as Susan said, we're, and I mentioned it earlier on in our budget discussions, that I, I feel we are, we are improving on our oversight in terms of this question of costs, revenues, developing a plan so that we can, when asked, say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll be getting to that in you know, 2030 or something, um, as we are with the bike plan and the park plan. I think you know, that's a great model. One clarification, I think I know the answer, but Dennis, when we bond for any water and wastewater improvements, those are all paid off out of the enterprise funds, out of the fees? Is that yeah, those are covered with our revenue bonds, okay. which are covered by those uh, utility fees. fees. Okay, thank you, that's what I thought. I want to make an observation about the photograph we see here of the Burlington Street Bridge, the part that's owned by the city of Iowa City. I would hope that once funds are available to do that reconstruction and it's done, and once Dodge Street is rebuilt, 
that we work with the state to t have the ownership of uh, and responsibility for Highway 1, tr or that part of Highway 1, Dodge Street and Burlington Street, transferred to the city of Iowa City. Uh, Ron, I know you and I, I have talked disagree. about that before, because that would enable us to do all sorts of things to Burlington Street in terms of uh, transforming it into a boulevard rather than uh, 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 just a thing full of fast-moving traffic. I, I think there's huge opportunity there, and we can't take that opportunity. You've persuaded me, Ron. We can't take that opportunity until we get ownership of the bridge. I'm, tr yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I would just disagree because I think what we take on it, in the short term it sounds great, but that means 20, 30, 40, 60 years out, the city has all of the financial responsibility for all of the maintenance and repair of very expensive bridges and very expensive road. So while it gives us, us some opportunity to do some things, I think the financial liability on the city in the decades and decades to come um, would not be worth it. But some other traffic route would become Highway 1. I don't know what that route is. I know there, can't uh, you know better than I do, but there have been possibilities explored. Yeah, so I don't want to make a big deal out the, of it. The, I think the perhaps an, another another option, and I know uh, other state DOTs have programs within their um, their capital plans for addressing context sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So it's not just this. Burlington reaming out the downtown, but Burlington adapting as it moves through the downtown. I think, you know, I worked on a project in San Francisco which won a Caltrans award. It was the um, replacement of the Central Freeway by a surface boulevard. It was a transformative project. Burlington could be a transformative project. Yeah, that'd be a better solution to, to have the state enable us to do the transformation. Just allow us to acknowledge that it's moving through the center of Iowa City. Okay, other comments or questions for staff? Thanks for making it in usable terms for the newbie. Um, and even uh, Ron and the digester <laughs> explanation. The digester is nice. Now, like Rockney, I can yeah. tell people I already knew what, that was <laughs> what it means. Have you done a tour of the wastewater treatment plant? I have not. Sign him up, seriously. Absolutely. Get him out there. <laughs> Full tour of the digester. Water plant, too. Yes. Yep. Okay. Just point out that the presentation that you see here is uh, will be available on the web. We probably need to um, uh, clean up a few small things. Uh, want to make sure that you are comfortable with where projects lay. So we'll give that a little bit of time in case you think of something as you digest all this information. <laughs> um, but then we'll make it available to the public, and it's really slick to use. Just clicking through yep. the tabs, you can kind of go to your neighborhood and view the projects um, that are upcoming. That's great. Very good. I, I just have to say, I think this is my 10th or 11th budget session I've sat through, and they keep getting better and better in terms of <laughs> just the way they're organized and now with the technology of the locations and stuff that we asked for two or three years ago. So great job. Yeah, well, The map Absolutely. is new. When did yeah. we start doing the map? Was that this two years year ago? Did. Last year we yeah. experimented Okay, because I know we had talked about that as an equity toolkit piece, and, and to see that in, in picture I think is fantastic. So great work. I also like the change summary. I like yes. it a lot. Yes. I like that. Very helpful. Okay, folks, thanks for the great job. Thank you for your help.